Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Myanmar's military detained government leaders, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and President Win Mint, over accusations of fraud in last year's elections. A year state of emergency was declared with army chief in charge. Is there evidence of election fraud or is there something else behind the military takeover? What impact will this have on Myanmar and the region and where will Myanmar politics go from here? To talk about all those issues and more, I'm joined by Chan Vanarith, president of the Asian Vision Institute in Cambodia, Shuja Nawaz, distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. Later, we'll also be talking to Professor Xu Qinghua from the School of International Studies at Renmin University of China. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, Chan, for starters, uh, what do you make of uh, the military takeover in Myanmar and why now? Um, I think the results of the elections in November last year show that the National League for Democracy have gained overwhelming support from the people with the votes the seats of uh, more than 80 percent. So that also uh, show that the military uh, link uh, political party was significant in decline. And also looking at uh, the power dynamics within Myanmar, we could see that the military may took risk uh, and to stage a coup in order to maintain its power and relevance. So looking at um, the process of the election itself, uh, even though it was not perfect, but uh, the result, objectively uh, speaking, uh, was credible. So uh, the coup uh, by the military is, by a legal standard, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a legal move. Uh, so to speak. And Shuja, uh, you, you think that the military has enough reasons to claim there is massive frauds in November's election, as they claim. Uh, they haven't produced uh, some uh, proof that is internationally recognized, have they? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think we have to wait to see what evidence they produce, uh, particularly of this uh, claim that uh, something like 8.6 million of the uh, votes uh, that were cast uh, had problems with them. Uh, so um, the other thing, of course, is 70% um, of the population that could have voted actually voted in the elections. 30%, uh, including the Rohingya area, um, were not allowed to vote because mm -hmm. of security reasons. So in that sense, uh, a, a portion of the electorate was deprived of its rights. But Chan, you earlier said that the military worries about losing their power. Uh, but actually, they have a very strong position in Myanmar's politics. 25% uh, of parliament seats were taken by military officials. Uh, they have a veto, basically, over major decisions. They are in charge of defense and uh, interior uh, security. So there is no incentive for them to worry about losing that power. Chan? Well, I think there perhaps there's some power dynamics there, even within the military itself, whether it is united with one voice or there are any different faction within the military itself. And of course, the civilian uh, government un under the leadership of National League for Democracy have gained more in terms of popular support. Uh, that may pose some threat to some factions uh, within the military itself. So uh, we, at this stage, we are not clear yet um, how the dynamic within the military itself and why they took such high risk or consequential move uh, to stage this kind of uh, coup. So, so that may explain uh, yet another uh, kind of power struggle within Myanmar, 
uh, within the military itself as well. And Shuja, uh, do you have any knowledge about the military's uh, development in Myanmar, how, how they have been evolving uh, over the years? And is there any legal basis for them to take over the government's function? Well, the military, uh, obviously, at the beginning in the fight for independence, played a huge role. And Aung San Suu Kyi's father was a revered uh, leader. Uh, and uh, that was one of the reasons why she uh, is, is, is so popular uh, in Myanmar even now. Uh, but um, as you know, I, I look at uh, the military and civil relationships in uh, my, my homeland of Pakistan and around the world, and there are similar patterns that one sees. There's a mixture that I see in Myanmar also of personal ambition coupled with institutional uh, imperatives. So mm. uh, there is a report that you know the, the army chief, uh, General Mendong Hang, uh, who was in, uh, just one year away from retirement, uh -huh. wanted to make sure that he stayed on. And he's also in his second term as army chief. So there may have been some personal element in it. And I, I, I do not rule out the possibility that the military is not monolithic, but um, it has the legal basis under the Constitution to intervene uh, using uh, certain clauses that say that there could be trouble uh, or that opposition and uh, protests are creating a, a security situation in the country. And that justifies uh, the the coup or the the pause. I don't think this will be a pause. Um, I, I cannot see the military being able to hold a new election within a year, uh, which it can then win from 33 seats in the current parliament to a majority um, in, the, in the over 400 members of parliament. If if your estimate that's is the military-backed parties will not win a majority in next year's election, then what are the calculations of the military? And you said it is not a monolithic establishment. Uh, do you foresee any instability within the military establishment? I think initially you won't, because uh, if they don't stick together, they're going to be in trouble. Uh, but as you have said, and as the other guest has also said, on paper, the military has a lot of strength. Uh, the Constitution provides them their uh, domination of the National Security Council, where they have a majority of the six members of the 11 members of the National Security Council. And they also have the three uh, security ministries uh, that they, they have seats in uh, the cabinet. So they have all that power. But Myanmar has changed. This is not the Myanmar. Uh, that was there when uh, Aung San Suu Kyi came uh, back into power or, or came back into contention for power. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a youth population. Uh, more than half the population is under 30. Uh, it is extremely well connected. And they're using social media, 22 million social media users in the country, uh, a total population of 54 million. So uh, they have the ability to coalesce uh, around an issue and create difficulties for the military. The other thing, of course, is the international community and how it reacts. And we mm. should talk about the possibility of targeted sanctions, uh, which can create a problem, but which really is a much longer term uh, instrument. OK, we we're talking about uh, san possible sanctions later on. Uh, the latest development, Chan, uh, is that Myanmar court has charged state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi was breaching an import and export law. Well, that's uh, very uh, surprising. A spokesperson from her National League for Democracy, NLD, said Wednesday, uh, and the Myanmar police have also filed charges against President Nguyen Mint, accusing him of violating what, uh, what they call a natural disaster management law. What do you make of these charges? Though they don't sound like charges you, you should launch against uh, heads of state. Well, it, it sounds ridiculous, and of course, it's uh, all politically motivated. Um, I just would like to comment on how long the military will stay in power, uh, whether the, let's say, the next election will give more 
seats or uh, support to the, uh, the military link political party. Um, I suspect that uh, this move uh, will not for one year, it will be longer. And the one year time frame is a pretext uh, in order for the military to stay on to power. But uh, this time is not like in 1990s. Uh, the Myanmar people are more connected mm. and they are more uh, a, a kind of um, a vocal uh, against the uh, legitimate government. So I think it will be a struggle, uh, perhaps, uh, among the people against the military at this time, which will be much stronger than what uh, happened in the 1990s. Uh, of course, uh, the NLD won a landslide victory in last November's election, but still uh, there were people saying uh, the NLD hasn't been very effective at solving problems uh, within Myanmar uh, in terms of national reconciliation, economic development, and the ethnic uh, 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 tensions. What do you say about NLD's uh, policies, John? Uh, state building, and to a large extent, uh, nation building, is a long process. And Myanmar has a complex history, com complex society, uh, different ethnic groups fighting together, I mean, against each other. So this is very complex country, which requires time and collective leadership and, of course, international support in order to build a state and to, to build a, a nation. So I think in the past five years, it, you know, it's, it's still a short time and it did many more years in order to build a stable government and kind of a, a, a national unity uh, across the country. Uh, so in the transition of one year, uh, Shuja, do you think the military controlled government will rule Myanmar in a different way? What kind of policies will they be uh, staging? Well, uh, one thing, of course, I, I doubt that they will continue the attempted uh, national reconciliation that Aung San Suu Kyi was seeking, and which she didn't coordinate with the military, which was perhaps another reason why they were unhappy with her. Uh, the one thing on which uh, she and the military appear to be aligned, of course, is the treatment of the Rohingya. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has attracted a lot of criticism internationally because of that and even for defending them uh, in the international court uh, against charges of, of so-called genocide. So um, they will, there will probably be um, serious differences between the population and the military uh, in, in what they can and, and can't do. Um, and the question of an election um, is really, I think, uh, very hard to believe at this time, uh, given the amount of work that needs to be done, and given the enormous gap between the military party that only got 33 seats and Aung San Suu Kyi's party that got 376 seats in parliament. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that is really a pipe dream. Um, and this is just simply an excuse uh, for the military to step in and uh, for the army chief to extend his stay in power. Uh, this is interesting, Chan, uh, the relationship between Aung San Suu Kyi, her party, and the military. But actually, the political transformation in Myanmar began in 2011. Uh, it, it has been a decade since this political process has been evolving. Why can they have political consensus on power sharing, on how to establish uh, the, the, the roadmap for political uh, consensus. Why, why is it so difficult in Myanmar? Well, I, I think um, there's, there's a period, you know, um, of kind of political uh, compromise, uh, power sharing, but uh, the last election really uh, show a, a kind of a, a strong uh, legitimacy to the LND. It's kind of serious humiliation for the military link political party, which got very, very you know, narrow uh, votes and seats at the parliament. So that, that is a kind of critical turning point. And as a previous panelist 
I mentioned earlier about the, the uneasiness of, uh, of the power sharing when it comes to Ro Rohingya issue and uh, the other you know, ethnic tensions um, uh, in, in Myanmar that military perceived that civilian uh, government uh, was not able to control uh, the, this kind of security issue uh, in the country. So, so that is a, a combination of different factors that, that uh, leads to, to this uh, stage of political crisis. Mm. Uh, but but Shuja, uh, as you earlier said, uh, how to handle the Rohingya refugees problem has been closely associated with the country of Myanmar. If uh, the military lose the support of Aung San Suu Kyi and her parties uh, defending them in the international arena, it will weaken uh, the Myanmar's uh, ability to, to, to make their case in the world. What, is, is, that, is that so? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, what will further weaken it uh, is, is uh, if there is a, a consensus among the major powers of the world on this issue uh, to pressure Myanmar to allow uh, its citizens to return uh, to, to their homeland, Myanmar. Uh, there are also trade uh, issues that uh, pressures can be put on them, uh, but that includes their largest trade partner, Thailand, mm. uh, which uh, shares a border with Myanmar, and uh, where even if there are sanctions, there will be smuggling that will allow trade to continue. However, there is, remember, a military uh, run government in Thailand at the moment that uh, may be sympathetic to what the military has done in, in Myanmar, and we shouldn't forget that. But China and the United States are major trading partners also of Myanmar, and they can together uh, target their sanctions in such a way as to uh, hurt the, the military leadership and put pressure on them to reinstate the government. Uh, th they should really be no fresh elections, in my view, mm. but the elections that were held, uh, unless uh, you can prove that there were massive irregularities, those elections should stand. All right. Uh, we will uh, take a look at what our digital team has gathered about uh, average Burmese thinking about what happened uh, in the latest days. Let's take a look. ဟုတ်ညာတော့မနက်ကကိုအဲ့ဒါခဲ့တဲ့ဒီမှာဖုန်းကလိုမှကောလိုမျာကိုပြီးရာကောလိုမျာကိုဒီကိုလိုင်း
Uh, we have another guest joining us uh, for the discussions, uh, Xu Qinghua, Professor Xu Qinghua from the School of International Studies at Renmin University. Uh, but Chan, uh, you just saw that film. Uh, it seems that uh, people in Myanmar worry about uh, inflation, whether they can still draw cashes from banks, uh, and, and whether they will have uh, stable livelihoods in, in the future. Uh, and we were told that a civil disobedience campaign is already in, in, in full swing in support of the deposed uh, uh, government. So what do you think the Myanmar people uh, will react to what happened? Um, first, I don't think they will stay quiet. Uh, they will take some actions or move uh, in order to protest against the military regime. So we, today we saw uh, a medical doctor, nurses at various places, hospitals in Myanmar, started to pro protest by not working. So, you know, it's in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, Myanmar have suffering a lot already in terms of the infections and the deaths caused by the pandemics and, of course, economic and social crisis. And now adding the political crisis, which led to the closures of borders, uh, banking and, and, you know, the, the supply shocks uh, and by purchase panic, panic purchasing and so on. So this is really a, a disaster for, for the, uh, the, the Myanmar people. But, but we understand that Myanmar was actually under military rule for more than uh, 50 years. They live in that period longer than uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the government of Aung San Suu Kyi. So will they stage any kind of a, a opposition to the military uh, who is now in control? Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Myanmar now is different from uh, 1990s uh, because they are more connected uh, through uh, the internet, social media, and they are more knowledgeable and informed about what's going on in the country and, and in the region. And there's a movement of uh, overseas Burmese migrant workers in different parts of the capitals across Asia they already started uh, protesting against uh, the coup at various uh, 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 locations across the region. So that is uh, something that uh, are different from, from, from the past. Okay, and, and Professor Xu, uh, of course, uh, Myanmar is a neighbor of China and China has in, been enjoying friendly relations with Myanmar for many years and recently the two signed a memorandum of understanding for a feasibility study on the China-Myanmar economic corridor uh, to link Yunnan uh, with Myanmar. So do you think uh, the Chinese investment and economic initiatives uh, will be affected by what happened in Myanmar? Uh, I don't think so. I'm uh, more um, optimistic because I think that the uh, cooperation between two nations are of common interests. And no matter military or the NLD, they own government, they all pursue the, the cooperation with, 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 with China. So um, China and the Myanmar, we have the uh, border um, uh, and also the, um, the cross-border nationalities, and we have long friendship um, uh, in history. And just as you said, that we just signed the um, strategic partnership and also the action plan for building a China Myanmar community with a shared future. And we also um, um, constructed together the Belt of the Road. But how, uh, so all the things, but how yeah, worried okay. should the Chinese be about instability uh, in Myanmar because of the political tensions? We share border with Myanmar, and also a lot of ethnic Chinese are living in Myanmar. Mm, yeah, you said it, that uh, within uh, the, 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 the following year, I think that there is uh, the uh, instability, so which will uh, uh, not good and helpful to the uh, bilateral cooperation. Um, but uh, what I said is, is for the um, after, uh, in my understanding, that the, what has happening, it's it's it will not be lasting a long time, okay. and also 
for the interests of the military. They don't want such things happening. Mm. And, and yeah. Chan, uh, the takeover of the military in Myanmar has been condemned uh, by some countries. U.S. President Joe Biden is considering sanctions, and the U.N. Uh, will probably have meetings on to talk about what is going on in Myanmar. So what do you think will be the response from the international community? I think uh, it's not only the country from the U.S. and Europe, but ASEAN, the regional countries, also raise concern and call for normalcy and the restoration of rule of law and democracy in Myanmar. Because Myanmar issue is not confined to Myanmar alone. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has a recent regional and international implications. In this context, ASEAN as a regional institution uh, need to find a way to engage uh, in order to provide a solution to some extent. Uh, for instance, to, to send observers to uh, 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 assess the election, for instance, in order to But do you uh, expect cooperation from the Myanmar military uh, if ASEAN decided to step in in any fashion? Well, ASEAN used to do it before, uh, before the opening up of Myanmar in 2011. So I think at ASEAN at this stage need to be more bold uh, and, and, and smart in engaging its member state in, in order to restore peace, stability, and prosperity because we are all interconnected and interdependent. Uh, anything happen in Myanmar affects all of us. So mm. we, I think ASEAN need to, to do something. And Professor Xu, in, in what way China can help uh, settle the disputes within Myanmar? Uh, of course, uh, China's stance has always been uh, non-interference in domestic affairs in other countries, but Myanmar is a close neighbor. Uh, what can China do? Um, uh, you know that we have our diplomatic uh, principle. We, we don't want to uh, we'll never uh, intervene uh, national issues uh, by foreign countries. Uh, so um, except uh, for that, we will uh, stand by uh, the, the interest of the, the people of the Myanmar and uh, uh, try to um, uh, push the two sides to have some peaceful discussing on negotiations. Uh, that is what I think the Chinese government will be doing. And do you think China can maybe play the role of mediator between the two sides? Is that possible? Um, I think uh, if uh, the two sides are welcome, I think that Chinese, uh, it, there is the possibility. But the condition is that if the two sides, they, they, they welcome. Mm. And, and Chan, what, what is the possibility of a political settlement for what has happened with uh, all sides uh, coming in to help? I think, uh, of course, the peaceful settlement uh, negotiation is something that we all want to see. Um, this is something that ASEAN and neighboring countries of Myanmar wish to see. Uh, any chance of being invited to resolve or to cool down the situation uh, should be welcome. So this is the, I think, the responsibility of neighboring countries and ASEAN uh, in order to help stabilize uh, Myanmar. Because, as I said, uh, we are interconnected. Uh, mm. So this is right. something that we need uh, to take a collective responsibility okay. and collective leadership in order to provide thank, solutions. Thank you very much, Chan, and thank you, Professor Xu, for your insights.